All right, so let's talk a little bit about what are intellectual property rights. Basically, these are rights that are granted by law, okay, um, to exclude others from using ideas. It's, it's basically what it is. You're allowed the right of a limited monopoly to um, an idea. And um, it's these laws, right, that give you these rights as the owner of an intellectual property um, to take you know, something like fire and light, you know, an idea, right? Um, and make it exclusive, um, turn it into an intellectual property, right? That it's the rights granted by law that allow you to take the intangible great idea and turn it into something that's exclusive and that's limited, okay? It gives us the right to monetize um, these intangible assets. Let's, let's turn ideas into money and allows us to privately own these ideas. But this is very important. It's what allows you to take something like fire, like light, like a meme, right? That wants to you know, spread um, and that doesn't lessen the original necessarily and make it scarce, make it artificially scarce. So, um, you know, how do you do, you know, some other examples are fuel, oil, right? There's not really a shortage of oil. They limit the refining and production of oil to make it more scarce. They limit the production um, of diamonds to make diamonds more scarce and to drive up the price. It's exactly um, what you do you know, with um, ideas using intellectual property um, laws or, or, or rights granted by laws. It's how you create artificial scarcity around you know, information, ideas, you know, innovations. Okay? Um, this is an agreement that you and I and everybody in society has implicitly made with inventors and authors um, and the federal government. Um, we don't actually sign anything or sign a contract. We just agree as being members of society, just like we agree to not kill people or to steal their shit. Uh, we also agree to not steal their ideas. Um, you know, whether you do it in life or not, that's, an, that's an, another thing, right? And what do we get in exchange by granting authors and inventors this, this right of exclusivity, right? Um, is that this stuff is shared with us. We get to use it. We get to access it. We get to, um, you know, consume it in, in some form or fashion under certain auspices um, of, of the law. Uh, in the United States, and, and, and for most of the world, frankly, these rights, these intellectual property rights, are to incentivize innovation. Okay, So um, you get a limited monopoly, meaning um, you have 20 years to profit off of your patent. The reason why you get 20 years of monopoly over that idea in the marketplace is that that income, um, that you know, income safety, that revenue, whatever you want to think of it, um, allows you to keep creating, allows you to keep inventing stuff, and who benefits from that is, is people in, in society, because we're all not inventors, we're all not movie makers, we're all not um, songwriters or game programmers, or, um, you know, we don't invent cures for cancers or viruses, um, stuff, stuff like that, okay, but it's an incentive, right? Um, in an economy where you need to have money to have food and to have electricity, right? Um, you need to be able to profit off of your art and your innovations, right? And you're able to do this through rights granted by law, okay? Um, it's very important though to think that like if you can control media and the expressions of, of, of culture and the expressions of history and the technology um, of it, you know, this is really about power, um, power. Um, and ide ideology, you get to control the ideas and how people also consume them. Um, and this creates gatekeepers, uh, you know, of various forms that get to gatekeep um, what ideas you hear and what you see and what you make and how you make it. But the internet and digital technology has created, a, you know, a democracy of access in so many different ways where we all can become creators, we can all become inventors, we can all become authors, and we can all share our content in a very different way than, you know, say 20, 20, 20 year, years ago or, or so. Okay? Um, but there's definitely an incentive to control technologies, to control texts and movies and books and news and information, um, and then monetize it.
Okay, so there's several types of intellectual property laws. Remember that laws create these rights. These rights are granted by law. All right, the first, number one, you want to know this stuff. This is important, okay? Copyright. Copyright protects the expression of ideas. A lot of people think express is, uh, it, it, it protects uh, ideas or it protects um, you from having your ideas copied. That's somewhat right. But it protects the expression of, the, uh, of an idea itself. So how do you express love? Through a poem, through a song, through a movie, you own that expression, or through a sculpture, or, or through a play, right, or a painting, or a photograph. It's expressing the idea of, of love, or what, whatever it is. So copyright protects things like books, magazine, articles, uh, term papers that you write, um, uh, uh, architectural drawings, dance choreography, uh, movies, photos, graphic design, uh, sculptures, uh, song lyrics, song compositions, uh, sound recordings, um, a whole bunch of those types of, types of things, okay? We'll talk way, way, way more about it, but the expression of, the, of an idea. So the minute you write something on a piece of paper or that you type it up or that you paint, um, that you finish a painting or you do a painting, um, that's you know, meets the threshold of limited amount of creativity and limited amount of originality, um, and you have the copyright on, on, on that. And you own that as a human being, as a, as a natural human, which we, we are, right? Um, for the life, your lifetime plus 70 years. So your great, 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 maybe great grandchildren will be able to profit off of um, your great expression. But it has to be in a physical medium, okay? And that's the, that's the important part. It has to be expressed itself, um, and it can't just be a general idea itself. It has to be a particular expression of a general idea. We'll get into that. Next is patent. Patent protects ideas as applied to inventions or innovations. Um, that's really what, what a patent is. Patent actually does protect ideas um, their th themselves, okay? Um, particularly technologies, innovations, pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, fabrics, manufacturing processes, um, you know, all sorts of, sorts of things that, that maybe you don't think of software, um, you know, which is like everything now, uh, you know, uh, machines, uh, um, you know, new chemical compounds, uh, uh, n uh, seeds, etc. cetera. Um, okay. Then we have trademark. Trademark protects um, something like, like this, a logo, catchphrase, name, slogan, um, color, fabric pattern that re represents um, the source of a particular good or service. So like the O, right? That were the stylized University of Oregon O or the Nike swoosh. Um, those are just, you know, some classic ex examples, you know. But any, anything, uh, you know, a name, a celebrity name, a movie name like Star Wars is all, all trademark business names, um, you know, Tiffany's blue boxes, you know, etc. And we'll get a little bit more into that. Then you have things like trade secrets, non-disclosure agreements, and um, non-compete agreements that are basically dictated by contract law. So trade secrets is this. You have something like a recipe for, let's say, a cola beverage, right? And when you would say pat, try to patent that, that cola beverage, the thing is this, is number one, when you patent that, you have to make the recipe known. Right? You make the recipe known, no one can use it, no one can use it until the patent expires in 20 years. Well, you probably, if you have a good cola recipe, you probably want to profit off of it longer than 20 years. So instead of patenting it, right, and at the end of 20 years, like, we get that, 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 um, that recipe, it's ours. Anybody could make that type of cola. So use trade secrets, which basically allows you to, um, you know, using a series of contracts, particularly non-disclosure and non-compete agreements, meaning you will not tell the recipe and you will not make a competing product. Um, it allows you to keep that 
cola recipe indefinitely, you know? And so you make people sign all these agreements so that they will not share. And that's basically what a trade secret is. It's, it's for something that, you know, typically could be patentable, but you um, don't want to make it patentable because you don't want to have to share that. You know, your monopoly is in keeping it secret. So you use non-disclosure um, agreements and non-compete agreements. Non-compete basically means that you cannot make a competing product within a certain amount of time. So if I have an awesome cola recipe um, and you work for my company, right? I make everybody at my company sign a non-disclosure, non-compete agreement, right? Which means that when you leave my company, you can't make a competing cola, you know, or whatever. And you, you can't tell my Coca-Cola uh, recipe or my, my cola recipe to Pepsi, you know, or, what, or whatever. So that's kind of, kind of what that is. And so contracts are often used to protect, in, protect intellectual uh, properties in various ways. We'll, we'll talk through that as the term goes along. All right, so a little bit about the initial copyright model, and this just to give you a sense, okay? Now, like I said, this all comes with the development of the individual, the fact that we start to see ourselves not as a group or as part of a group, but as individuals, as autonomous, important individuals um, within society, that we become, you know, more narcissistic, more selfish, etc., etc. And this is a development you start to see in 13, 14, 1500, I mean, probably, you know, before that, but like philosophically, you start to hear a lot about it um, in like the 14th century, et cetera. Um, you start to have intellectual property rights that come out of the uh, 15th and 16th centuries uh, in Europe, primarily in Venice, Italy, where um, textile manufacturing was uh, a huge business. And that's where you start to have the concept of patent that starts to come come from uh, Venice, Venice, Italy. Um, but here's how copyright started. And this is the model that got embraced in the United States. And this is why I bring it up. Uh, in uh, England, um, there was a private company called the Stationers Company. And uh, the Crown granted them the exclusive right of copy. So if you were an author, a human author, and you made a book or you made a map or something, um, you know, the only way to get it published was through the stationer's company. Now, the stationer's company also was a gatekeeper in that, you know, you couldn't write a book um, that spoke ill of, of the kingdom or of the king or queen, um, etc. But that, uh, you know, you were not an author by law. You know, the stationer's company owned the right of reproduction for, for, your, for your work. This all changed in 1710 with what's called the Statute of Anne. And basically this stripped the stationer's company of its right of copy and bestowed copyright, the right of reproduction to natural authors, humans, people. Um, and this was monumental. Um, it turned copyright from you know, something that was private into a public grant, something that would you know, be benefit authors and benefit society. Okay. Now, there's two very important things that come from this that will be on the test, okay, that got embedded into um, American copyright law. The first thing is what's called limited terms. So under the statute of Anne, copyright lasted for, it's raining, uh, lasted for 14 years. Um, if you lived long enough or you thought that there was, um, you know, uh, another 14 years worth of market on your book or map, um, you could file to extend that copyright for another 14 years. Very important. That's number one. The second important factor that came was after those 14 years uh, ended or after the 28 years ended, right, your work fell into the public domain, meaning it was no longer yours, meaning that anybody could make copies, that anybody could adapt it, that it became the, pro the property of the publics of society and that was part of the grant you were given the limited amount of time to profit off of your work right and that work would benefit society in some form or fashion and then after you had enough time to profit from that work right it became the property of society and that's called the public domain so two things that come from this that influence the united states big time are limited terms a limited amount of time and then uh 
public domain. So when that limited amount of time expired, it became the property of the publics. So in this class, I give you a lot of slides that have information on it that I may not really touch on, that I don't really need you to know, but I kind of want you just to have a sense of where things come from. So the United States Constitution, right? This is like basically every rule, federal rule in the United States, um, you know, comes from this document that was written by, you know, uh, noble, crusty, old, wealthy, white dudes uh, in the United States. Um, many of them were authors, many of them were artists, many of them were inventors. So before, uh, you know, they saw the value in free speech, freedom of assembly, right to bear arms, all these things that got uh, put into the Bill of Rights, which are like the Bill of Rights is like the oops, <laughs> oops, you know, like maybe we should have had that uh, in the Constitution. Um, that's what the Bill of Rights more or less is. But anyways, these framers of the Constitution thought that, you know, they were, they all, you know, all had come from England for the most part um, and, you know, had saw, seen what, you know, private copyright did there. So um, they gave Congress this limited power to, and this is what it is. It's often called the Copyright Clause, the Patent Clause, the Innovation Clause, um, whatever. And you don't need to know, you don't need to memorize it, you don't need to know what it is. I'm just telling you what it is, right? And it's Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution if you want to get real fancy with it. Um, but basically it grants Congress the right to promote the progress in science, uh, progress of science and useful arts by securing, and this is real important, limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to the respective writings and discoveries. But really think about limited times. That's incredibly important in this, okay? In interpreting this, right? An exclusive right for a limited amount of time. So what this tries to do, and what, you know, you have the philosophy in the U.S. Um, with intellectual property rights in general, is that there's a balance. There's a balance between culture and the publics, the people, and authors. So, so the laws are written in a way, or intended to be written in a way that balances the wants and needs of authors and inventors with us society. Um, and that's very important. And in this sort of balance, there's another balance between how much protection do we give your ideas, right, and how much, and therefore how much money can you make during that limited amount of time where you have protection, and how much creativity and innovation will come out of having this limited monopoly. So it's a, this balancing scale between authors and society and, and um, you know, uh, amount of protection to amount of innovation and, and trying to strike a balance between all these, all these things, okay? Um, and also to sort of balance the economic rights, so the rights to make, make a buck, with the moral rights, the rights for authors and inventors to control how their art is used and in what ways their art is used. The United States model is specifically an economic incentive. You're given a limited amount of time um, to have a limited monopoly on your invention or your creation. And in that time, um, you know, like you're, you're able to um, make money to earn, earn a living. However, you have very limited moral protections, meaning that um, someone can take your painting um, and do a parody of it and not give you credit and destroy the integrity of your work, mock it, mimic it, make fun of it. And they can also profit from it and it's totally legal. Other systems like Europe that has a moral rights, uh, more of a moral rights sort of background basically suggests that the author's intent is important. Um, that you must give credit, but you also must not, you know, tarnish the original work. There's less protection towards appropriation, what we'll call fair use, and we'll get into that over the, the next few weeks um, and, and months, okay? Okay, so this is very important. Our Constitution, where intellectual property laws come from, that grant rights, are based on this concept. Less protection will allow for more innovation, okay? So the less time you have to just sit on an innovation or a movie or a piece of music and profit off of it 
will encourage you, incentivize you to create more. You need to create more because you can't just sit on a movie for a hundred years and profit off of it. Oh wait, actually you can, because that's how the laws are now. But the intent was, you know, you have less time, you're afforded less protection, but enough so that you'll keep innovating. Because you have to, because you're gonna be poor, <laughs> because you're gonna be sad, right? You need to make new shit, okay? And what happens here is the less protection that you have, the less of a monopoly you have, the less monopoly rights that you have, there's gonna be more competition. More competition is gonna enter the marketplace. And what does more competition do? It drives down prices. It makes products better. Guess who it behooves? Oh, sorry, robot. <laughs> us, right? Society, us peasants, us consumers. That's good, right? It's supposed to be for us. But the problem is, as we'll sort of see, is that companies, corporations have influenced um, these laws that have been written in their, in their favor. So, um, and ultimately, you know, the way when these laws are amended to favor companies, they also have to be amended for us. So it's really hard for me to sit here and argue um, that, you know, uh, a song that I write when I'm 20 uh, whose copyright expires 70 years after my death is encouraging creativity from me 70 years after I'm dead. Um, you know, the problem is a company never dies. They just go bankrupt. So anyways, point is, less protection equals more innovation, okay? And there's plenty of, of, of markets like this. The clothing market has very, no copyrights in it, right? But you know, companies continually make new products, right? Because they have to, because they have to stay innovative versus, I don't know, a studio like Disney that just keeps rehashing stuff all of the time, just reboots, remakes, adapts from, from its catalogs, right? And when you have, you know, less time of protection, you know you have to keep making stuff. You have to make new stuff um, to stay a leader in your market, right? And because of this, you know, you have all authors and creators that are making more new stuff, right? And they're competing uh, for our money and our dollars and our loyal loyalty. Um, and this is just super duper uh, important to the model. Okay. We'll take a break here in a quick second. Just what are moral rights? Um, you know, moral rights are basically when we think about um, inventions and uh, creativity are contain two things, right? attribution, right? You have to give the original inventor or artist credit um, and you must maintain the integrity of the artist's work. So it means you can't change it, you can't distort it, you can't uh, destroy it. It must remain in its whole, its original artistic intent um, intact. Now in the United States, uh, you know, authors have very limited moral rights, if any, any at all. You're allowed to you know, do, you know, without credit, destroy their work as long as it's commentary or, or criticism. However, authors can own, um, you know, may not own the copyright or own their work in any way, but still maintain a moral right over it. So a great example is that almost all recording artists from the probably the late 60s onward in their contracts have a remix clause, which basically allows them to say yes or no to a remix. Although the record label owns the copyright to, to the recording itself, the author has via contract a moral right to shut down the remixes of, of their work. So the United States is heavily influenced and in, in, in its system is guided as an economic incentive model, whereas more countries in Europe have uh, a moral rights sort of basis to their, their, their laws. So we'll take a little break, take a nap, take a walk, take a chill, have a shot of whiskey, um, have a jewel, whatever you got to do to cut loose. I'm going I'm to fix my robot friend, uh, get him dialed up, get him dialed in, and we'll, we'll be back for part three of our exciting day.